Hi, in one of my previous videos I did some work with Cobb LED panels, like this one uh, right here. I subjected them to various voltages and amperages, I measured the wattage, measured the temperature that they produced, uh, with the idea of uh, making myself some new workbench lighting. And put these up here, mount them in a bracket, drive them with a constant uh, current power supply uh, so that I can have a dimmer on them. Um, I was planning on the second and concluding video of this series being when I wrap the whole thing up and control it with a Raspberry Pi, uh, but I did run into some interesting stuff with the voltage regulation. So I thought I'd spin off kind of an intermediate video. At the stage I'm at now, I do have the thing sort of prototyped out. I got a couple lights sitting there, kind of scraggly wired up. It is actually hooked up to a uh, dimmer. Let me uh, run over there, turn it on, and sight. So up the bright, down to dim, kind of somewhere in the middle, switch back off again. Uh, so that's my work in progress. Uh, so some interesting things did come up while I was doing the uh, constant current power supplies for that dimming feature. And I thought I'd talk about some of the, the interesting lessons that I learned while doing that part of the project. So the first lesson learned has to do with inductor selection and switching frequency. So I presented this power supply before when I built a cob lead fixture and my intention was to use it again driving some slightly higher currents. This is an LM2576, a 3 amp regulator. Um, I figure I could drive my 12 volt panels at 3 amps. I could get up to 36 watts per panel. It's just a simple switcher. It's right out of the data sheet. You've got the LM2576 regulator, you've got a 100 microhenry inductor, you've got a diode, you've got a capacitor on the output, you've got a variable resistor to set the voltage limit, and as I've gone through in my previous uh, projects, you've got an op amp and a current sense resistor to add the constant current capability. Now what I found when I actually ran this up to 3 amps is this inductor got very, very, very hot. Um, so this is a 3.5 amp inductor, and I measured this at 2.2 amps. Uh, this was at 190 Celsius. Uh, you can see it's a relatively small um, wire-wound inductor. It's not shielded. The data sheet clearly says it's good to 3.5 amps. You know, even figuring for 20% additional current like the regulator says, um, I did not expect this thing to be getting to 190 Celsius. So I have to wonder if I'm either not reading the data sheet correctly on this inductor or maybe it's just not quite accurate about the current this thing is able to take. So I did look into other inductors. For example, I've got this one here. It's also by the same manufacturer, but it is physically taller and it's actually a shielded inductor. It's also 100 microhenry. Um, I did try uh, switching one of my boards to this inductor and it did generate less heat, so I think the current carrying capacity of this one was a little bit more accurate the current capacity, carrying capacity of that one. Plus maybe it has some additional heat dissipation area with all of this uh, magnetic shielding material. Maybe it's acting as a bit of a heat sink. But still, even this, I, I don't know if I was going to get up to my full 3 amps of desired output capability without generating too much heat. So what you can do is you can select a switching regulator with a higher switching frequency. Um, and that will allow you to use a smaller microhenry inductor. Opting with a smaller inductor um, in terms of microhenries will often lead you at the same package size to a higher amperage rating. Now I don't know why this is, I haven't cut them open to find out why, uh, maybe it's with the um, lesser inductance they're able to use thicker wire or maybe there's less wire, I don't know, but whatever, if you look at data sheets you'll find that as you raise the inductance in a given package size you'll often decrease the current handling capability. So the advantage of going with a higher frequency switcher lower value inductor is that you can fit a higher current inductor in the same footprint with the higher frequency regulator. And we'll see that here with the data sheets for the LM2576 and the LM2596. The LM2576 calling out for this 100 microhenry, whereas the LM2596 calling out for a 33 microhenry. 
So in my case, switching from the 50 kilohertz LM2576 to the 150 kilohertz LM2596 is going to easily let me get past that heat problem um, that I was having. Even better might be to switch to this 300 kilohertz uh, XL4005. Now you can find these XL4005 baseboards up on eBay. Um, they seem quite popular. Um, this is one here that I bought for a couple bucks. Um, it actually has an XL4015 which is slightly different from the XL4005. You can see it's got a big wire wound inductor. Um, as usual the diode is in there. There's an op amp hidden there, a couple pots to set the current voltage limits and your capacitors. Um, I kind of evaluated this just to see if the XL4005 was an option for me uh, before ordering some of the ICs themselves. The ICs, to get them seems kind of difficult as the major parts houses didn't seem to have them in stock and I did actually have to go to eBay to find that IC. So what I will do is I will build up a couple of these boards um, using an LM2596 at 150 kilohertz and a board using an XL4005 at 300 kilohertz and see if that takes care of my heat issues. So I've been having some trouble with this power supply of mine and I wanted to figure out what's going on. So this happened when I tried to upgrade from the LM2576 which is a 50 kilohertz regulator to an LM2596, which is a 150 kilohertz regulator. Uh, but my circuit wasn't working very well. Um, a couple of times it just outright failed, a couple other times it's been getting hot. So I put the oscilloscope on it to look at the waveform that's coming out of it. You can see I've got a, a regulator installed here. It's um, not soldered in. It's actually getting quite hot. Um, it's not soldered in because I've been swapping these things in and out and soldering them. It's getting to be a pain in the butt. And I've got the um, I've, I've got the oscilloscope hooked up to the catch diode. So if we capture a frame on this, uh, the first thing we'll notice is it's giving us like a nonsensical frequency, 101.25 megahertz. That's obviously not right. I think it's picking up a bunch of spiky noise stuff in there. But we can use the cursor feature on this. Um, to figure out what the actual frequency is. So I'll set one cursor on the end of that wave and I'll take the other cursor and I'll set them onto the end of that wave and it says right here 53.19 kilohertz. Um, now that's obviously not correct if we look at the data sheet it says 150 kilohertz switching frequency so yeah, something, something is clearly wrong. And let me try a couple more regulators to make sure, oh, that thing's hot, uh, to make sure it's not just, switch this one on, capture the frame, same, same waveform, same frequency. It's a new one installed, let's switch it on, capture a frame, there we go, uh, same, same waveform, same frequency. So that's three of my eBay regulators um, that are clearly not working correctly. Now let's try an LM2576. This is a 50 kilohertz regulator. Plug it into the board. Switch it on, and we'll capture a frame. There we go. Um, same waveform, 53 uh, kilohertz more or less. So certainly this LM2576 and these eBay LM2596s appear to be the same part. Only this one says 2596 on it. This one says 2576 on it. So here's a picture of the voltage regulator under the microscope. As you can see, it does clearly say LM2596T. Uh, so this regulator is clearly a fake. Um, I'm not the first person to have encountered this, so looking here online, I did find like an EEV blog 
thread uh, describing someone else who ran into fake LM2596s. And the lesson learned from this is to stop buying cheap regulators on eBay unless you can be certain they are authentic. Uh, the insidious thing about this regulator is that it does work well enough when you solder it in circuit that it appears correct. You know, at a 50 kilohertz signal, it's still regulating, it's still generating the voltage that you expect. But it's not going to have the longevity of the proper 150 kilohertz part because all of your choices for inductors and such were based on 150 kilohertz switching frequency, not 50 kilohertz. So you're either going to end up with too much ripple or too much heat, or the whole thing is going to burn up in some catastrophic manner. And an important point is um, saving a few cents on a voltage regulator, even a few dollars on a voltage regulator, could cost you a several hundred dollar device that you have plugged into this voltage regulator. Consider, for example, if you were using this to build an iPhone charger. You burn up your iPhone because you saved two dollars on buying a counterfeit LM2596. Um, so I say just no more eBay voltage regulators. I'm going to start buying them from a reputable source like DigiKey. Now let's try this regulator that I got off DigiKey. It cost about six times as much as the eBay regulators. Let's plug them into the board, power them up, and catch a waveform. There we go, that is quite different. First of all, it doesn't have all that noise crap in it. And secondly, the frequency looks to be around 150 kilohertz. Let's move our cursors. Catch the tail end of that one, and then move this one. Hundred and thirty five point one kilohertz, assuming I got the cursor mostly accurate. Um, certainly, that is acting like you would expect an LM twenty five ninety six to behave. So the next lesson learned is to stop buying cheap multi-turn pots on eBay or even to stop using uh, multi-turn pots at all in my power supply circuits. Uh, so here you can see one I designed into the board. Uh, it's a 25 turn uh, pot. I think it's uh, the typical part number is a 3296. It's adjustable via this screw on the top. You turn the screw 25 times to get from one side to the other this particular pot was used to set the output voltage. Now this might look like a Borns 3296 but it is not. I got a whole baggie of these from eBay. They are called a Baoter, B-A-O-T-E-R. Uh, before that I got Biochen ones or something like that. There seem to be a lot of these. If you look on eBay they all have um, different um, manufacturer names stamped into them and you can buy them very very cheap. So this whole baggie I think cost me less than one Borns uh, 3296 on DigiKey. The problem um, these devices they're, they're sort of they're inherently an electromechanical device. If you cut one open I think you'd find that there's a worm gear attached to this screw that turns kind of a, a rotating potentiometer. Um, anytime you have like a worm gear system like that, you run into backlash and slop in the gear. So if you turn this clockwise and pass your set point and then turn counterclockwise to get back to where you want it set, there'll be a little bit of um, slop in there. And, and I found these seem to have a lot of slop. For example, if I passed my set point, I would have to turn this back two turns before the reading even started moving again. Now the other problem with this pot is it's horribly susceptible to temperatures. Now this may be my own fault. You can see I've located the pot right next to the voltage regulator IC. The voltage regulator IC does get very hot. Um, 150 Fahrenheit on this particular board. And I noticed that you know if I set this thing at room temperature and then I run the board at a couple of amps for a few minutes. 
Um, this thing has drifted by up to a volt um, until it cools back down again. Now the third and most significant problem I had with this is I got this all assembled into my work lights and all of a sudden my work lights started flickering after a time. And I think what was happening with that flicker was that this pot is it's noisy or scratchy inside with respect to temperature and I think as, as the whole area heated up it was starting to lose conductivity or get additional resistance in between the wiper and, and the potentiometer surface and, and the thing would just sit there and flicker. Now the question is if I'd have gone with an actual name brand Borns pot would my experience have been better? Well it, it might have been. It probably would have been constructed better but I wonder if it still would have been heat susceptible. Um, I didn't actually spend the money to get any Borns pots to try them out. Uh, what I did instead and what I think is the right answer is I used a couple of fixed resistors. I don't have a picture of that board handy but um, the way I designed my circuit is that you can remove this pot and you can substitute in two fixed resistors um, that mimic what the pot would have been set to. Now the data sheets on every one of these switching regulators will tell you how to calculate the value for those resistors. So you use 1% uh, metal film resistors um, you can get it the set point pretty much where you want it and I think it, it gives a lot less susceptibility to uh, temperature related drift effects it's also a cheaper approach than using one of these pots um, and let's face it when you're designing a circuit you probably know what voltage you want it to output so the next lesson I learned was about high side versus low side current sensing now if you watch my video before on these uh, voltage regulator boards you'll notice that I did high side current sensing so the voltage output from the regulators coming out of the um, the inductor and and the capacitors was fed into a current sense resistor as you can see I actually have 10 resistors in parallel um, that allowed me to use smaller wattage resistors and, and parallel them to get higher wattage um, so anyway the voltage comes out of the regulator into the current sense resistor and then from there making its way out to the output jack and then what I did is I measured on these two points on this current sense resistor I called them sense high and sense low fed them into a differential op amp and measured the voltage difference by measuring the voltage drop across that resistor you get the amount of current um, so this worked out great in my 12 volt supplies but there is a downside if you have a 12 volt regulator then these sense high and sense low points are going to be around 12 volts so in my case that meant running the op amp at a few volts over 12 volts so I think I used a 15 volt zener or even a 13 volt zener uh, shunt regulator to supply power to the op amp now if you want to scale this up as I was looking to with my cob panels to make a 24 volt um, switching regulator now these sense high and sense low points are around 24 volts um, feeding into the op amp, the op amp needs to be running around 24 volts. Now that starts to become real inconvenient to have your op amp power supply up that high. Some op amps don't go all the way up to 24 volts. Some of them are plus minus 15 volt. So there is an alternative, which is over here. I'll try to put these um, close together. Can we see them both? and that is to take the current sense resistor instead of putting it up here on the voltage output from the regulator put it down here on the ground return so you can see I just moved the resistors from up here on the output of those um, capacitors and inductors moved them down here to the ground line the differential amplifier with the op amp it doesn't care whether this resistor is up here on the V plus side of your output or down there on the ground side of the output it's just looking at two different voltage points um, one on the left side one on the right side now the advantage of doing this is that this signal here um, rather than being way up here at the V plus output which could be 12 or 24 volts or whatnot it's now relatively close to ground um, so assuming you've got a 1 ohm 
uh, sense resistor and you're doing three um, amps through that, um, you've got like about three volts. You could easily use a five volt regulator to get your op amp power rather than having to go through what I went through here with this Zener shunt regulator and um, regulating this up to 13, 15, or 25 volts in order to capture that high side. Thank you for watching my video. Please visit my website at www.smbaker.com for more electronics projects and sand rail stuff. Bye.